Welcome everyone to the last talk of today. Uh, it's on fair division of indivisible goods. This is a classical uh, topic, but new to AGT. So uh, we'll see what new things are happening. Uh, uh, given by Angelis Markakis, the famous LMM, uh, one of the M's <laughs> of <laughs> LMM. <laughs> Uh, he's an assistant professor in Department of Informatics of the Essence University of Economics and Business. Um, his interests, apart from AGT, are algorithm design, uh, in general, theoretical computer science. And okay, uh, so uh, thanks a lot for the invitation, first of all. And it's a great pleasure to be here and to give this tutorial, uh, which concerns an old topic, but uh, as uh, Ruta mentioned, there have been some uh, new developments recently. So this uh, is a tutorial on fair division for indivisible goods. Okay. Uh, so let's, uh, uh, let's see what uh, the problems uh, are about. Uh, so we have some set of uh, resources. And um, as you see, the resources can be uh, highly inhomogeneous. Here we have a cake. Uh, the cake has, uh, uh, you know, in some parts there are fruits like cherries and strawberries. There is chocolate. Uh, so people can have different uh, preferences. Uh, so the input here is uh, a set of resources along with a set of agents, possibly with different preferences. And the goal is to come up with an allocation of the resources uh, in some fair manner. Of course, uh, this is an ancient problem, and empirically there have been some algorithmic ideas uh, really early on. And uh, in terms of mathematical formulations, uh, the first publication appeared shortly after the Second World War. And as I said, there is a rich literature by now, uh, not so much for indivisible goods. Uh, and uh, recently there has been a revival, uh, especially concerning the problem with uh, indivisible goods. So uh, let's, have, let's see first some entertaining uh, early references on the subject. Uh, so as I said, uh, some uh, simple algorithmic ideas have been around on fair division. Uh, in ancient Egypt, for example, there are some reports about uh, some algorithms for land division around uh, the river Nile, uh, because this was the most fertile land. Uh, in ancient Greece, uh, there, are, there is a nice mechanism, actually, a, f a fair division mechanism when it comes to sponsoring theatrical performances. In particular, uh, these performances were sponsored by the most wealthy citizens of Athens, and uh, somehow they invented a mechanism that was giving incentives to the wealthy citizens not to avoid sponsoring a performance. Okay? Uh, actually, this was a pretty cute idea. Uh, and uh, there are also early references on the cut and choose protocol, which uh, I, I guess most of you are already familiar with that. Uh, even as early as 8th century BC, uh, cut and choose is mentioned not under the name of cut and choose. Uh, in uh, Theogony, which is an epic poem by Hesiod, uh, and in particular Prometheus and Zeus are running the cut and choose protocol. Uh, and later on in the Bible also there is an application of cut and choose by Abraham and Lot. Okay, so, okay, let's move on now to more modern stuff. Uh, right now, uh, there are already some uh, available implementations of some of the algorithms. Um, a very popular one is the Splitit website by Jonathan Goldman and Ariel Procaccia, uh, where there are some algorithms implemented for various classes of problems regarding rent division, division of goods, and, and some other categories. Um, in NYU, there is also a software for implementing some particular algorithms for two players. And also in Harvard Mad College, uh, some available implementations are, uh, are there already. Uh, okay, so uh, let's uh, slowly start uh, modeling the problem that uh, we want to study. Uh, so in order to proceed, uh, we need to have a way to model preferences, okay? Uh, and this is done by assuming uh, the existence of a valuation function for every agent. So vi will be the valuation function of agent i, and vi of s is the value that he gets for obtaining a subset of the resources, s. And uh, for the type of resources, uh, there are two major classes of models. Uh, there is a class of continuous models where the resources are assumed to be infinitely divisible. 
so over there, usually, uh, we assume that the resources are represented by the interval from 0 to 1. So valuation functions are just probability measures on 0, 1. Uh, and there are the discrete models where uh, we have a set of indivisible goods and the functions are defined on subsets of the goods. Okay, now for this talk, uh, we will focus on the discrete setting. I will only briefly mention some open problems for the continuous setting at the end of the tutorial. Uh, but from now on, uh, let's assume that we have a set of indivisible goods uh, and we have a set of agents and uh, we're looking for an allocation of the whole set of goods. So we are not allowing goods to, be, to remain unallocated. Uh, so basically we are looking for partitions. Uh, I will denote a partition by a vector. So this S1, S2, Sn is a vector of uh, subsets. Si is the subset allocated to agent i. Okay. Uh, now, uh, the valuation functions will be defined on subsets of uh, the goods. And uh, the assumptions that I will make is that we have some normalization. If someone gets the empty set, there is no value for him. And I will also assume monotonicity. So uh, if I get more goods, I have more value. Uh, these two assumptions will hold for any valuation function I will talk about today. Uh, there are, of course, some special cases of interest. And uh, a big part of the tutorial concerns the additive case, uh, which is also the assumption made in the majority of the fair division literature. So additivity here means that uh, it suffices to specify vij, which is the value of an agent i for a good j. Uh, if I do that, then my valuation for any subset is determined just by the summation of vij for any uh, good in the subset. Okay? Uh, so additivity gives us also a compact way of representing the instance. Uh, but uh, we will also go beyond that. Uh, and uh, uh, before that, uh, I will let me say that uh, we are also interested in some uh, even further uh, restrictions uh, beyond additivity. Uh, we will talk about additive agents with identical rankings. So this is the case when the goods more or less have a similar value for everybody. Uh, which means that everybody has the same, the same ranking on the values of the goods. This is a very interesting, actually, uh, special case. Uh, sometimes we will also mention what happens when we have identical agents, so the same valuation function for everyone. And we will also go beyond additivity. Uh, we will briefly see what we know about uh, submodular valuations, which is a superclass of additive valuations. Uh, this is a the class that captures uh, decreasing marginal values. And uh, another superclass is the class of subadditive valuations. So it's better to show you the picture. Basically, uh, subadditive is a, sup a strict superclass which contains both submodular and uh, additive. Okay, but uh, most of the tutorial will focus here, and we will see some extensions to submodular and subadditive valuations later on. Okay. So here is an example. With additive valuations, all we need to do is uh, specify uh, a matrix, uh, an n by m matrix, uh, specifying the values of Charlie, Franklin, and Marcy from the peanut characters, if you're not familiar. Uh, OK. So let's start with uh, some definitions now. Uh, we'll try to see first uh, some solution concepts that have been proposed. And later on, we will see what do we know about them in terms of uh, algorithms and uh, approximation. Uh, the, historically, the first concept that was proposed is the concept of proportionality. Uh, what does proportional mean here? So an allocation is proportional if uh, for every agent, every agent thinks that according to his own valuation, he gets at least 1 over n of the value that he has for the whole uh, set of resources. So if everybody thinks that he got 1 over n of the total value, uh, that means that everybody thinks that he got a fair share of uh, what was there to be allocated. And as I said, uh, historically, this is the first concept that was studied uh, by Steinhaus, Banach, and Knaster. Uh, they actually uh, worked on this uh, during the Second World War, uh, but the publication came a bit later, after the war was over. Okay. Uh, a stronger concept is that of envy freeness. Uh, envy freeness means what you can imagine that uh, you know, everybody thinks that uh, what he got, so VI of SI, is at least as good as what anybody else, everybody else got according to his own valuation. Okay, so this is a tougher problem. 
Uh, it was suggested as a math puzzle, actually, in the 50s by Gamow and Stern uh, in a book about mathematical uh, puzzles. And later on, it was more formally treated by Foley and Varian. Um, and uh, as I said, it's a stronger concept. Uh, in particular, if we have these inequalities here, if we sum up for every uh, J, for every bundle of the valuation, uh, what we get is that uh, we get that n times vi of si will be at least vi of m because we are summing over all j. So that means that uh, uh, n freeness implies proportionality. Okay. So here uh, we see uh, an allocation that is both nv free and proportional. Uh, Charlie gets uh, the Vespa. He is not envious of uh, Franklin because uh, these two uh, have a value of 30 for him, so it doesn't matter. Okay, and uh, the same goes for the other uh, pairs of players. Uh, this one is an example of a proportional but not envy free allocation. Okay, so here um, Charlie envies Franklin because uh, this totals to 40 and he gets only 35. He does not have any value for books. Okay, so. Okay. Uh, a third notion, which is even uh, stronger, is the notion of competitive equilibrium from equal incomes. Uh, now, uh, this notion is defined in terms of uh, pricing of the goods. Uh, so suppose that everybody was given a budget. L this is a virtual thing. Uh, suppose that we allow everybody to have an equal budget uh, to purchase uh, goods. Okay? So this is just a thought experiment. Uh, now, we say that uh, <coughs> well, a, a competitive equilibrium consists of an allocation of the goods to the players, along with the pricing on the goods, so P1, P2 to PM is a pricing on each good, uh, such that the value of every player is maximized under SI, under what he got, subject to the budget constraints. So everybody has some budget. Uh, this is the pricing. Uh, buy the goods that maximize your, uh, uh, your, uh, that maximize your value subject to the budget constraint. Uh, if this happens for everybody, then we have a competitive equilibrium. So we said that an allocation is a CEI allocation if uh, it admits a pricing such that the allocation along with the pricing is a competitive equilibrium. Now, as I said, this is a strong concept, uh, but it's also what many economists uh, consider to be one of the ideal uh, concepts for fairness. Uh, so I quote here from Arnsperger uh, that to many economists, competitive equilibrium is the description of perfect justice. Of course, okay, not everybody agrees with that, but uh, the reason is, the reason that there is this enthusiasm for competitive equilibrium is that, uh, first of all, a competitive equilibrium is envy free. And this is true because people have equal budgets. So if there was, if there was some other bundle that I would be envious, well, uh, I have the budget to buy it because the other person bought it with the same budget, okay? Uh, and it's also Pareto efficient uh, in the continuous setting. In the, with indivisible goods, it's not always Pareto efficient, but it is uh, when there are no ties, essentially, when there are no two bundles that can have the same value. So it combines uh, efficiency and fairness, and that's why it is generally you know, liked as a concept. OK, so we have seen uh, three concepts so far. Uh, competitive equilibrium is stronger, and the freeness is a bit more relaxed, proportionality is even more relaxed. Uh, the problem is that uh, all these three concepts, um, there are some issues with indivisible goods. Okay? Uh, they are too strong when it comes to indivisible goods because there is no guarantee of existence. Uh, apart from that, as we will see later on, there are even hardness of approximation results. Uh, so it seems that these three concepts are a little more appropriate when it comes to continuous uh, resources. Uh, so what we will do from now on is uh, we will consider relaxations of these uh, versions, of these uh, concepts, uh, with the hope of getting something which is more amenable for indivisible goods. Okay, so uh, we will move on uh, with uh, three types of relaxations. The first one is what we call EF1. EF1 is envy freeness up to one good. By the way, if there is any question, uh, please go ahead and stop me during uh, the tutorial. Uh, so, uh, EF1 means that uh, maybe there is some envy, but uh, there is a way to eliminate envy if I delete one item from everybody's bundle. So, for every pair of agents, I and J, uh, 
uh, we say that an allocation is satisfies EF1 if there exists a good okay, uh, A such that uh, agent I will not envy agent J if we remove A from the bundle of agent J. Okay, so beware of the quantifiers here. We say that for every pair there exists an item. It doesn't mean that this is the same item, you know, whenever we look at player I. Uh, this notion was defined by Budish, uh, surprisingly only within this decade. Uh, and uh, let's actually look uh, at an even stronger notion, uh, which is still a relaxation of envy freeness. Suppose that we now uh, require something uh, stronger. We say that an allocation satisfies EFX uh, if uh, uh, we take a, a pair of players, I and J, and we demand that any good that we remove, uh, it eliminates envy. In particular, even if we remove uh, the least valuable good, this will eliminate envy. Okay? This is uh, EFX. So it's a stronger concept than EF1. Uh, this was defined even more recently, uh, last year, uh, in a paper by Karajanis and other uh, authors in 2016. And uh, of course, uh, as I said, uh, EFX is a relaxation of envy freeness, and EF1 is a relaxation of EFX. Okay. Uh, and now let's look at the relaxation of proportionality. Uh, let's uh, change gears and go to the notion of maximum share allocations. Uh, okay, so let's again look at the different thought experiment. Uh, suppose that we want to come up with an allocation and that uh, we allow one player to control uh, not the allocation on the whole, but the bundles that will be created. Suppose that we choose a player uh, and we tell agent I that uh, he can suggest a partition uh, of the goods into bundles, into N bundles. Okay, uh, and then uh, we let the other players choose a bundle out of uh, the partition suggested by agent I. Uh, the worst case for I is that uh, he will be left with the least valuable bundle out of the partition that he created. Uh, so in that case, the best that agent I could do is to try to produce a partition that maximizes the minimum value of a bundle. OK, so this gives rise to the following definition. Uh, this um, new I of n, comma m, so it depends on the number of agents and on the set of goods. Uh, it is a max mean definition. Uh, the maximum is taken overall partitions of the goods. Okay, so by P n of m, we mean partitions of goods into n bundles. Uh, and the minimum is taken over the bundles of a particular partition. So uh, I want to maximize the minimum value in a partition. Okay, uh, this is mu i. It was introduced in the same paper where EF1 was introduced by Budish. And uh, we say that an allocation is an MMS allocation if for every agent i the value that he gets is at least the maximum share. Okay? We want this to hold for every i. Uh, okay, and uh, it is actually easy to see that uh, this is a relaxation of proportionality. Okay? If we have a proportional allocation, if everybody gets at least 1 over n of the total value, he will also get at least this uh, mu i. Uh, okay. Uh, so this, here we see an example. Let's look at uh, Charlie. Okay, why is mu1 equal to 30? Uh, well, the thing is that uh, we have an instance of three agents here, so Charlie uh, should try to, uh, to partition the goods into three bundles, and no matter what he does, uh, he could produce one bundle here, another bundle, and uh, this here is another bundle, that will be 35, 30, and 35. No matter what else he does, the minimum value will never exceed 30. So the best he can guarantee to himself is a value of 30. Okay? Uh, here, Franklin, uh, the best he can guarantee is a value of 40. Okay? He can do 40, 40, and then these other things together. Uh, and the best Marcy can do is guarantee herself a value of 30. Uh, there is this bundle here, this one, and uh, this together, or any other way you do it. Uh, you will see that uh, uh, you can get at least 30, uh, but no more. Okay? Uh, so let's see now, we have defined uh, three new notions. They are all relaxations of the more standard uh, fairness notions. 
And let's see how do they compare. Uh, we've seen how EF1 and TFX compare. Uh, how do MMS allocations compare to EF1 and TFX? Uh, well, actually, uh, these notions are incomparable. So there exist EFX allocations that are not MMS, and uh, there exist MMS allocations that do not satisfy EF1, and hence they do not satisfy EFX either. In fact, it goes even further. There exist proportional allocations that do not satisfy uh, EF1 or EFX. Okay? Uh, let's look at an example. Uh, let's uh, see at one of the two uh, things here. Uh, so here, we see an allocation that is an MMS allocation. Uh, why? Because Chuck gets 30, okay? so he gets his MMS. Uh, he also gets much more than his MMS, uh, than his share. And Marcy gets exactly, again, her MMS. Uh, so this is an MMS allocation. Uh, why is it not EF1? Well, the thing is that uh, Charlie here, uh, he envies Frank, Franklin because, uh, okay, uh, he got the TV and the Vespa. And uh, these are worth 35 plus 35, okay, a total of 70. And even if we remove one item uh, from this guy, uh, he has a total value of 30. And any item we remove, the remaining item has a value of 35 for, Char for Charlie, so he will still be envious, okay? Uh, so MMS allocations do not need to satisfy EF1 or EFX. Okay? Uh, so here is um, uh, the implications that we have. Uh, so this is a stronger one. Then we have MMS. Proportionality EFX, incomparable. Uh, proportionality implies MMS. EFX implies EF1. Now, uh, this line of reasoning here is for general valuations, for general monotone valuations. Okay, the bottom line, uh, it holds for additive, it also holds for subadditive, but uh, it doesn't hold for general valuations. And pictorially, if we want to look at uh, the space of allocations, uh, uh, this is uh, the zoo that we have to deal with. Okay. Uh, okay. So, are there any questions regarding the definitions so far? Yes. Yes. So, what is the budget? I mean, does that matter? Say it's a budget of one, or uh, we could say we could do some normalization and we have a budget of one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the prices can be scaled according to the budget. Yes, it's clear. Yeah, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah, at the end. Yeah. We, the valuations are monotone anyway, uh, but we want to allocate all the goods. Okay. Yeah, we are not leaving goods unallocated. Yeah, and some other question? Okay, uh, here we are. Okay, so an allocation is com CI allocation if uh, it admits a pricing such that S comma P uh, is a competitive equilibrium, such that the bundle maximizes the value of the player subject to the budget constraint of the player. Okay. Where is the cost of the goods are the same for each? Player? Yes, yes, yes. So this is a price for every item. So it's the same price for everybody. It's not. Yep. Yeah, you can scale the prices. Okay, nobody will buy anything then. It's uh, yeah. So so you cannot have an equilibrium with inf with prices set to infinity. But, uh, yeah. So uh, then we would not have a, a CI allocation. Okay. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't need to impose an assumption that... So the if typical market equilibrium has this assumption that... Yeah, yeah, but uh, okay, all, all I want to do here is define when is an allocation, a CI allocation, so I don't really need to care about uh, this. Yeah? Yeah. If there is a pricing such that this happens, then this is a CI allocation. Yeah? Okay. okay, good.
All right. Uh, okay, so this finishes the first part, uh, which uh, was the uh, uh, part concerning uh, definitions. And now we can move on to see what do we know about uh, all these notions. And as you will see, a, a lot of these things have been uh, uh, published within the last uh, two or three years, uh, on this, especially on the relaxed uh, versions of fairness. Uh, so let's start actually with envy fairness and proportionality. As I said, for the stronger notions, we have mostly bad news. Uh, we have bad news because, first of all, we don't have any guarantee of existence, uh, neither for proportionality and with free CI. Uh, and it's even NP hard to decide if uh, a proportional allocation exists. And this is actually very easy to see because even for two identical agents, this is the same as uh, the problem of make span on identical processors. Okay, so uh, this is really uh, the partition problem. So, so NP hardness is easy, but apart from uh, NP hardness for existence, uh, it's NP hard to compute any decent approximation. There have been some hardness results uh, known for quite some time now uh, for trying, for example, to approximate the allocation that achieves the minimum possible envy or the best possible proportionality parameter. Uh, so instead of getting one over n, can we get a constant divided by n times the total value, where the con so this constant should be less than one. Uh, if that uh, also is a very hard question. So existence is not guaranteed. It's even NP complete to check existence. It's hard to get any approximations. So uh, these are really hard problems for indivisible goods. Uh, it, it is still open if there exist any interesting subclasses that admit uh, good approximations for, say, NV fairness and proportionality. On the positive side, uh, there is one positive result, uh, which says essentially that when the number of goods uh, grows with respect to the number of agents, then uh, if we look at a random instance, uh, there is a probability that goes to one that an NV free allocation exists. Okay? In fact, there is a positive probability, a good probability, that simple algorithms could find such an allocation when the number of goods uh, grows. Okay? Uh, this is the only positive result that uh, we know about these concepts. So for the remaining of the talk, uh, we will focus on, on the relaxed uh, versions. So let's go first and see uh, what happens with EF1 and TFX. And let's start with the easier one, uh, and with freeness up to one item. Uh, can we have existence? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was just wondering, do we know, uh, you mentioned the average uh, randomness. Yeah, uh, so, uh, so uniform distribution, say, for, for additive valuations, okay? So suppose that here you produce an instance by taking VIJ to be a uniform uh, on zero one, let's say. Yeah, okay, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, for NV, no, I, I would not say that they're isolated. Uh, you, you can very easily produce uh, instances where NV free allocations do not exist. Uh, so, yeah, as the, number, as the number of goods grows, uh, I don't know if it's measure zero. But definitely, it, uh, they are, it, it becomes less and less. And less. The thing is, though, that uh, give me any number of goods, I can produce easily instances where NV free allocations do not exist. Okay. Uh, but yeah, if it has measure zero, uh, it's not. It's not. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, good. So. But for MMS allocation, this question that you asked makes also good sense for MMS allocations, where uh, there it's more intriguing what, what is happening. OK, so for EF1, uh, so do they exist? Well, for EF1, we have very good news. Uh, for any monotone valuation function, uh, EF1 allocations exist, and they can be computed in polynomial time. And in fact, uh, they can be computed by, especially for the additive case, by very simple algorithms. So let's uh, go through this. Yeah, oops. OK, uh, let's look first at the additive case. So for, okay. for the additive case, uh, a round robin algorithm suffices. Uh, we can fix an ordering of the agents and just perform a round robin. 
Uh, so while there exist unallocated items, pick the next agent according to the round robin order and just give him his most favorite piece. Okay? Uh, go to the next agent in the order, uh, do the same and continue until all the items are allocated. Uh, this works for additive evaluations and it's very easy to see why it works because uh, suppose let's say agent one is the first agent in the round robin order. Okay, he gets his favorite piece but after that, in the remaining of the round robin algorithm, every other agent picks before him. So for the remaining of the algorithm, uh, nobody will envy the bundle allocated to agent one beyond that point. So the envy for agent one could be up to his most valuable item, so that means that it's a EF1. The same goes for the other agents, so the allocation remains CF1 throughout the algorithm. Uh, the problem is that this does not work for non-additive valuations. Uh, and for non-additive valuations, actually, it's more insightful to think of a more combinatorial approach. Uh, it's more useful to look at uh, the envy graph of the allocation. So we'll use a graph theoretic representation of the problem as follows. Uh, given an allocation, not necessarily an allocation of the whole set of goods, uh, we define the envy graph uh, by taking the nodes to be the set of agents and there is a directed edge if I envies J under the specific allocation under consideration. Okay? Now, uh, why is this uh, representation useful? Uh, it is useful because it guides us towards producing an EF1 allocation as follows. Uh, so suppose that we look at the graph, suppose that we have already allocated some goods and we look at the current graph and we see that uh, in the current graph there exists a node with n degree zero. That means that there is no incoming edge to this node so nobody envies this node. If we allocate now the next good to this agent uh, people will envy this agent at most by one item. Okay? So this is a good case. Now, if this is not the case then every node has in degree at least one. That means that there is a directed cycle in the graph. Uh, so if there are cycles, that means that uh, there is, uh, you know, uh, at, there are some agents such that the first agent wants the bundle of the second agent, the second agent wants the bundle of the third agent, and so on, and the last agent wants the bundle of the first agent. Okay. In that case, what we can do is that we can eliminate the cycles uh, by doing these uh, backward swaps along the cycle, as the cycle dictates. And in that case, uh, if we keep eliminating cycles this way, uh, people get better and better bundles, and uh, eventually we will reach uh, a graph that has some node within degree zero. Okay, so this suggests the following algorithm. We fix the ordering of the goods, and at iteration i, we find a node within degree zero, by possibly eliminating as many cycles as needed, uh, and we give the next good to agent J. Uh, okay? Uh, so, why is this uh, correct? Uh, why does this uh, terminate, first of all? Well, uh, the thing is that uh, how many times do we need to remove cycles here? Uh, the nice property is that every time we remove a cycle, at least uh, one edge. Uh, uh, goes away. So the number of edges in the graph uh, reduces by at least one. So that means that in worst case, uh, this step here uh, will take me about n square iterations and after that there will definitely be a node within degree zero. So I can continue running the algorithm. Okay? Uh, so, and why is it EF1? Because again, at every step uh, we give an, an item to an agent that nobody envies at this point. So we create envy at most by the good that we give to this agent at this point. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this works for any monotone valuation function. So EF1 is, uh, you know, is a well-behaved concept. It always exists, and we can always compute it in polynomial time. Let's go to EFX now. So this is uh, uh, a really challenging concept. It has uh, great open questions. Uh, for EFX allocations, we know that they exist for two agents and for general monotone valuations. Uh, for n greater than or equal to 3, uh, the picture is still you know, unclear. 
It's a great open question. Uh, it's guaranteed to exist uh, only with agents with identical valuations. Uh, <coughs> and uh, let's see actually this result. Let's, let's go through this uh, existence result. Uh, so uh, this is actually uh, a result that will appear uh, in January in upcoming SODA. Uh, so uh, we'll take a detour in order to see how existence is established here. Uh, we will define uh, a different notion, the notion of uh, Leximin uh, allocations, uh, which is as follows. The Leximin solution is an allocation that maximizes the minimum value attained by an agent. So it produces an allocation, it looks at the values attained by the agents, and it's the allocation that maximizes the minimum such value. If there are ties, then it picks the allocation that maximizes the second minimum such value. And if there are ties, it picks the allocation that maximizes the third minimum, and it keeps going like this. So it produces uh, a lexicographically uh, maximum allocation. We can see that this thing essentially induces a total ordering on the set of allocations. And uh, the global maximum under this ordering uh, is the Leximin solution. Now, how is this related to our stuff? Well, in a paper that, as I said, will appear next month, will be presented next month uh, by Plout and Raf Garden, uh, they defined a version of this Leximin solution, which they called uh, Leximin++. Plus Plus. Okay, <laughs> very computer science name. Uh, so, what is Leximin++? Plus Plus? Uh, so, again, we try to maximize the minimum value attained by an agent, but we do one more thing. Uh, we also try to maximize the bundle size of the agent with a minimum value. Okay? So first we do that, and then we move on to the second agent. Then we try to maximize the second minimum value. Again, try to maximize the bundle size of the, uh, of the guy who gets the second minimum value, and we keep moving in this way. Okay? So this uh, maximizing the bundle size is the plus plus in the, um, in the definition. Okay, now the interesting thing is that uh, a Leximin solution may not be EFX, but a Leximin++ plus plus solution is EFX. Okay? So for general, but unfortunately not for every valuation function, uh, but this is all we know. Okay? For general, but identical agents, so if we, everybody has the same valuation function, it doesn't have to be additive, as long as it's a monotone function, this Leximin++ plus plus allocation is an EFX allocation. Okay. Uh, yes. So for uh, for EF one, you said that for any monotone values. Yes. Yeah. Is there like a proof that uh, based on some potential function? For EF one. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know of any such proof, but uh, I don't know if there exists because you can get EF one by this algorithm. So. I'm not sure if anybody has bothered to produce such a proof, because for additive, for example, you just do a round robin and you get it. Uh, and for non-additive, this graph theoretic argument gives it to you. But uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm not aware if uh, anybody has considered you know, coming up with a different proof. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so the interesting thing is that we do get existence of EFX for general but identical valuations. Okay. Uh, so uh, now, uh, this result is existential. Uh, it, it just says that uh, EFX allocations exist only in this uh, setting. Uh, what about uh, algorithms? So in terms of algorithms, uh, let's see what we know. Uh, again, all we know is uh, this theorem here which provides a separation between general and additive valuations. Uh, for general valuations, there is a, an exponential lower bound on query complexity, even for two agents with identical and submodular valuations. So the problem is quite hard. When we move on beyond additive valuations, uh, the problem gets really hard. Okay? For additive valuations, yeah, okay, yeah, so I didn't mention that. So when we have additive valuations, uh, we can represent an instance by the values of an agent for every good. So uh, a metric suffices for representing the input. Uh, when we have non-additive valuations, uh, we cannot write down the whole input uh, because you need to define the value for every subset of the goods. 
so we assume that uh, the algorithm has a query, can ask queries to the agents about the values for, set, for certain subsets. So the algorithm at any given point can pick a subset and ask an agent what is your value for this subset of the goods. Okay, and then the complexity is in terms of the number of queries that the algorithm needs uh, to ask. Okay? So that's the computational model for non-additive valuations. Now, in terms of positive results for EFX, uh, we know of a polynomial time algorithm for two agents and arbitrary additive valuations. Okay? And we know of a polynomial time algorithm for any number of agents when we have additive valuations but with identical rankings. So this means that all the agents agree on the ranking of the goods according to their value. Okay? Uh, actually, it is interesting to, to look at this first. So let's see why we can have EFX for additive valuations with identical rankings. So suppose that we have such an instance. Everybody agrees about the order of the goods. Well, in that case, we can just run the cycle elimination algorithm okay, uh, by doing one small trick first. We will order the goods from the highest value to the lowest. So I take first the highest good, I allocate it, I keep moving on that order, and every time I do this trick with uh, eliminating the directed cycles. Okay? Uh, why does this work? So as I said before, this is definitely EF1 by the previous discussion. Uh, it is EFX because we do this thing with this specific ordering and because agents agree on the ordering. Okay? Uh, every time we allocate one more item, the envy we create is with respect to the lowest value, to the least valued item at this point. Uh, so that means that the allocation remains EFX for the sub-instance of the goods that I have looked at so far, and at the end of the algorithm we get an EFX allocation. Okay? Uh, but again, okay, this crucially depends on the fact that the agents have the same ranking on the goods. Okay. Uh, and this is really all we know about uh, EFX. It, it is a difficult problem, but uh, uh, yeah, we are optimistic that uh, th this is really a, a great uh, topic for research for young PhD students. Now, uh, I said that for two agents, we can do even better. Uh, we can have an algorithm for any additive valuation. So it does, for two agents, they don't have to agree on the order of the goods. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Because I can do this simple variation of the cut and choose. I can do the following. Uh, I pick agent one, and I run the previous algorithm for two agents with agent one and a copy of himself. So I basically I do it with, uh, by running it for two identical agents having the valuation function of agent one. Okay? So that produces an allocation that from the perspective of agent one is EFX. Okay, so then, so th what does this mean? It produces two bundles of goods, and agent one is okay uh, if he gets one of the two. Then agent two picks her favorite of the two bundles, so he's definitely EFX. In fact, agent two is envy free. He does not envy agent one, and agent one picks the remaining bundle. So that gives an EFX allocation for two agents and any additive valuations. Uh, Okay, so this summarizes the state of the art for EF1 and TFX, and we will now move on to the uh, other relaxation, to maximum share, to talk about maximum share allocations. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a great question. I will talk about this at the end of the tutorial. It's one of the directions I want to mention. Uh, yeah, so all... Right now, I, I'm assuming that the agents are not strategic. They are reporting their true valuations. Uh, yeah, there are some impossibility results that I, I will uh, talk about this at the end. Okay. Okay. Um, okay so uh, <coughs> uh, let's move on now to maximum share uh, guarantees. So for maximum share allocations, okay. Again, let's start from existence. Uh, recall this is a relaxation of proportionality. Proportional allocations are not necess uh, do not necessarily exist. For maximum share allocations, uh, existence is guaranteed for two agents. Uh, and actually, this is again via a discrete version of cut and choose by 
I, I will mention actually this in the next slide. For three agents onwards, the picture is really very intriguing. Uh, the answer is no, okay? So they do not necessarily exist. Uh, but it's not like uh, the case of proportional allocations. In proportional allocations, as I said, it is always very easy to construct examples where proportional allocations do not exist. For MMS allocations, uh, I would say pretty much 50% uh, of this paper was to prove that they don't necessarily exist. So it was a very sophisticated uh, construction by Prokacha and Wang that was in EC of 2014. Uh, so they do not necessarily exist, but the counterexamples are very subtle, they are very delicate constructions. And uh, in fact, um, uh, before this paper, there was an experimental uh, evaluation of this concept by Bouveret and Lemaitre. Uh, and uh, their simulations, they ran extensive simulations, they produced uh, random instances, and they did not get a single counterexample. They did not get a single instance where an MMS allocation did not exist. Uh, so uh, the picture seems to be that uh, MMS allocations seem to exist pretty often, uh, but okay, not uh, always. Okay, uh, it's for addi additive valuations. Yes, so for three agents and additive valuations. Okay, so uh, let's come to computation. Since they do not exist, MMS. Uh, very large, uh, really large number of items in this in this uh, construction. The number of items was really large. Actually, there is a follow-up paper uh, where, if I remember well, I think even with a linear number of items, uh, linear in the in the number of agents, uh, they showed that again it does not exist. Now, in terms of computation. Uh, MMS is a problem that is very suitable for uh, looking at approximation algorithms. Uh, what would an approximate allocation be here? So we would say that uh, we have an alpha MMS approximation if we can guarantee that uh, the value of agent i at this subset is at least alpha times the MMS guarantee. Okay? Uh, so let's start again with additive valuations. Uh, so for additive valuations, uh, for two agents, uh, where we know that they exist, uh, the question would be whether we can compute actually exact MMS allocations. Well, uh, this is not possible. It's even NP hard to even compute the quantity mu i. Uh, so we don't hope that uh, we can compute in polynomial time an MMS allocation. Uh, but uh, let's look at what uh, we can do. So existence of MMS allocations, as I said, for two agents comes from a discrete version of cut and choose. Uh, in particular, let player one compute a partition that guarantees mu one to him. Since they always exist, this is possible. So this means that agent one needs to produce a partition into two bundles that are as equivalent as possible. Uh, so then player two can pick his best out of the two. And this guarantees mu one to agent one and mu two to agent two. Now the problem is that uh, this step here, okay, so producing a partition uh, is NP hard, uh, but uh, uh, we can use one of the existing results in uh, the context of job scheduling. So, for example, Voginger has a PTAS for maximizing the minimum completion time when we have two identical processors in, in the context of job scheduling. Well, this is exactly the same as what we want to do here. Okay, player one wants to produce a partition that maximizes the minimum value. So uh, this means that we can get, we can convert this step into a polynomial time algorithm by losing epsilon in the approximation. So for two agents, we can compute in polynomial time a one minus epsilon MMS allocation. So for two agents, we have pretty much the best we can hope to have. Now for three agents onwards, uh, uh, this was a much more challenging uh, uh, problem. Uh, let's start with an easy uh, result. Uh, let's start with getting a half approximation. Uh, to do that, uh, we'll start with a round robin algorithm. Uh, let's go back to the round robin approach that we used for establishing EF1. Now, as I said, an EF1 allocation is not necessarily an, e an MMS allocation, but uh, definitely the round robin gives some guarantee. 
The guarantee we can get from round robin is uh, that I get at least mu i minus the maximum value of any good for any agent. Uh, and this is easy to see because, as we said, uh, um, the first agent may get his favorite good, and then the remaining of the algorithm goes through uh, well for the rest of the agent. So uh, you may lose uh, up to this uh, Vmax uh, uh, quantity. Uh, the problem is that this is an additive guarantee, and how could we transform this into a, a multiplicative approximation? Well, we can look at uh, the bad instances for round robin. Uh, the bad instances are instances where uh, we have goods with very high value. Okay? This is when round robin really goes bad. Well, in that case, what we could do is that uh, we can take care of these goods by just allocating them to some agents and uh, just forget about them. Okay? So the suggested algorithm is that uh, you can get rid of the most valuable goods by allocating them to some agent. And then, OK, after a certain point, you can run round robin. Uh, so this suggests the following algorithm. We start with these quantities here. Uh, so S is initialized to the set of uh, goods. So these parameters here for every agent is, that is the proportionality parameter, is VI of M over N. And uh, as long as there exists a, a pair of an agent and a good where Vij is at least alpha i over 2, uh, this is what uh, we consider to be you know, highly valued uh, item. Then we allocate this good to the agent. We forget about this agent. We reduce n. We update the set s. We recompute these quantities here. And we keep doing this again and again until uh, we no longer have this while loop. Okay? Once we're done with this, then we run the round robin algorithm. Okay, why does this work? Uh, because essentially we get rid uh, of uh, highly valued goods. And essentially what we are left with is uh, with a greedy round robin. Actually, yeah, let's go back. Uh, once this is done, we run greedy round robin with goods that are not valued more than vi of m over 2 times n. But as we said, uh, if we have a proportional allocation, if we have vi of m over n, this implies MMS. Well, if we have half uh, proportionality, this will imply half of MMS as well. So that's how we get uh, this half approximation. Okay, so we use the additive guarantee with the fact that Vmax is at most uh, uh, the proportionality parameter divided by 2. Okay? Uh, now, uh, actually, I'm cheating a little bit here, because in order to make this work, we also need this lemma. Uh, this lemma says uh, something about the monotonicity of uh, the maximum share of an agent. Uh, I keep allocating the highly valued goods, so I need to ensure that when I run greedy round robin, uh, the MMS approximation that I compute there is an MMS approximation for the original instance. And this is ensured by this property here. If I delete an agent and I delete an item, then the maximum share guarantee in this uh, reduced instance is at least as big as the maximum share guarantee in the original instance. So with this lemma, I can get this half approximation. OK, so uh, that's good enough. I can get half. Now, beyond half, um, I could say try to modify this uh, uh, round robin approach by getting rid of uh, even higher valued items. I could define a good to be highly valued is if it's at least of value two times alpha uh, by three. Well, that doesn't work actually. Uh, half is the limit of this approach. Okay. Uh, because uh, if I do this, then it's not clear how to modify uh, the second phase of the algorithm and get a good guarantee. Okay? So beating half needs different approaches. And uh, actually, there have been already three approaches. Um, but all of them have gotten the same approximation. So it's possible to get a two-thirds approximation in polynomial time. This was first uh, highlighted by Prokacha and Wang, where they got an algorithm with a two-thirds guarantee. Uh, the dependence was polynomial on the number of uh, goods, but exponential on the number of agents. Later on, together with my PhD student, Georgia Manatidis, and with uh, Nick Zat and Amin Saberi, we got a 
two thirds and almost two thirds approximation, which was in polynomial time for any n and ten. And even more recently, uh, Barman and Murthy got uh, a two thirds approximation uh, with a, a different approach, again for any n and ten. Uh, I will briefly highlight how these algorithms work. I will not go into the details. Um, uh, now, uh, the two thirds approximation of these two papers uh, relies on the same, it's the same framework basically, uh, but it's a different implementation of the framework that uh, provides these different guarantees. Uh, as before, for the half approximation, we use the monotonicity property of the MMS function. Uh, again, we exploit certain monotonicity properties of uh, mu i, but uh, it's, uh, it's not as easy to describe what kind of monotonicity we, uh, we rely on. Uh, it has to do with uh, doing some kind of recursion and uh, getting a guarantee again for sub-instances that uh, uh, result after removing a set of agents and a set of goods. Okay? Uh, so this is to be able to, to move to reduced instances and argue about them. Uh, we have to rely again on some results from job scheduling to be able to compute certain approximate partitions from the perspective of specific agents. And we also have to rely on certain matching arguments, in particular on uh, algorithms for perfect matching or for finding efficiently counterexamples uh, when perfect matchings do not exist. Uh, in order to be able to decide which agents we will satisfy in the current iteration and which agents will be satisfied uh, in the next iterations of the algorithm. So the high level description is that uh, these are recursive algorithms. In every iteration we take care of at least one person and during each iteration uh, one of the agents produces a partition that guarantees uh, the MMS, his own MMS and then uh, we try to find we're trying to understand which agents can be satisfied by this partition. Okay, so we try to find the subset of the agents uh, such that they can be satisfied by some of these bundles and such that enough value is left over for the remaining agents. In order to do this, uh, what we do here is that if, uh, if a certain bipartite graph that uh, represents the current problem uh, having bundles in one side and agents on the other side. Uh, if this bipartite graph has a perfect matching, then we're done. If not, then we have to, to do this um, identification of, a, of uh, you know, a, a subset of agents that can be satisfied at this iteration. Okay. Now, uh, a different approach, uh, and in fact uh, simpler, uh, conceptually simpler, uh, was shown by Barman and Murthy in uh, EC of 2017, uh, where uh, it was shown that uh, we can use this uh, cycle elimination algorithm uh, after first we, we establish the following property. So the interesting thing is that uh, uh, in this paper is that uh, it is shown first that uh, to establish an approximation for maximum share guarantees it is enough to establish it for identical valuations with identical, uh, uh, for, sorry, for additive valuations with identical rankings. If we do that, uh, then focusing on this class, uh, it is shown that the cycle elimination algorithm, after ordering the goods according to the value, okay, uh, which is common for all agents, uh, achieves a two thirds approximation. So combining these two lemmas, we get a two-thirds approximation again for MMS. Now, uh, so as you see, we have three papers now that achieved a two-thirds approximation. Uh, and let's see what happens in some even more uh, special cases of this. Uh, the case of three agents here for, the, for finding MMS allocations is really a very challenging case. In terms of, uh, we do know better approximations, as I will show you now. But we still do not know um, what is the best approximation we can get. Uh, N equals 3 is the case where problems start with MMS. Uh, so for, for two, as we said, MMS allocations always exist. For three agents, they don't necessarily exist. In fact, not even a PITAS is ruled out. Uh, and uh, the progress that has been achieved so far is as follows. 
you know, every year we move on by, you know, a couple of integers, but uh, we still have some way to go, okay? So first, Prokachi and Wang got a three by four approximation for three agents. Later on in our paper, we got a, initially we got a six by seven, and uh, the moment we wrote this down, we realized, oh, actually, this gives a seven by eight approximation. Uh, and then this year, uh, we had a eight by nine, and I don't know for how long this will keep going. Uh, maybe next year we'll have a, a new result. So, uh, but we really believe that there exist better approximations here. But uh, yeah, they seem hard to find. Okay. Uh, this is in contrast to some you know, scheduling problems or some other allocation problems uh, with additive valuations, where for three agents, usually you are able to get you know, some pitas. OK, now, uh, what about non-additive value? Yeah. Yeah, for general n, it's two thirds. Uh, actually, there is a recent improvement. I will mention it. No, actually, for lower bounds, we have pretty much no lower bounds because these constructions uh, they don't provide an absolute constant uh, for. Um, so a pitas is not. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, now for non-additive valuations. Uh, OK, for arbitrary valuations, there are no positive results known. Uh, for submodular valuations, there, is, uh, there was some progress uh, this year. So for agents with submodular valuations, there exists a 1 over 10 uh, approximation uh, in polynomial time. And this actually is by modifying appropriately the round-robin algorithm. So the round-robin algorithm is a pretty simple algorithm. But when it comes to some modular valuations, it does give an approximation. Uh, uh, the algorithm itself is very simple to state, but the analysis is very interesting and very, uh, uh, from a technical point of view, it's, it's, a, it's a very nice uh, proof. Um, and in fact, even more recently, there has been some more progress. Uh, this is not yet a published paper. As far as I know, it is available on archive. Uh, which gives a polynomial time three quarters approximation for, for the additive case. So this makes it the currently best approximation we know for additive valuations. It gives an improvement for submodular valuations as well. It gives a one third approximation for submodular. And uh, for subadditive, uh, it also provides uh, a log gamma approximation. Uh, so, yeah, as we see, um, uh, some progress is still happening about this problem. We think that maybe it's possible to even go beyond uh, three quarters here. Okay. So, yeah, all of these are still. So, is the, is the law for subadditive just because they usually think that a subadditive is uh, Actually, I'm not sure. I don't remember the, the proof of this. Yeah, it's only recently that I, uh, uh, that I got to take a look at this uh, paper. Okay, so uh, uh, this summarizes uh, the state of the art in, uh, with respect to all these uh, relaxed uh, versions. And I want to spend actually a few minutes to talk about some uh, related open problems, uh, some related actually uh, research that has happened in uh, the last few years, and some other research directions uh, on this field. So first of all, uh, in this tutorial we covered only three relaxations of classic fairness notions. Uh, can we think of alternative relaxations to envy freeness uh, and proportionality? Uh, and yes, there exist uh, other ways of relaxing uh, or, or of considering you know, other fairness notions. Uh, so first of all, uh, in the paper by Karajan et al. Uh, last year, uh, the notion of pairwise MMS allocations was uh, defined. This is related to MMS, but uh, not actually directly comparable. So what, what is pairwise MMS? Uh, well, consider an allocation of the, of the goods to the agents and take a pair of players, I and J. Uh, and now, uh, think of all the partitions of the goods in SI union SJ, okay? Suppose that I take these two subsets, and I can now think of any other way of partitioning these two, uh, the union of these two subsets. Uh, the fairness requirement in pairwise MMS allocations is that I want the value of agent I for, uh, 
for the subset of goods that he received to be at least, uh, again, it's a maximum definition. But now I take the maximum over all possible partitions of uh, SI union SJ and the minimum of the two bundles. Okay? So if I achieve this, then I have a pairwise MMS allocation. Now, this may look uh, related to MMS, but it's not actually. So it, uh, it doesn't mean that one implies the other. Okay? They are incomparable. Uh, what we know is that uh, this is a stronger criterion than EFX. So it's a stronger concept. That means that uh, the fact that we do not know if EFX allocations exist for arbitrary additive allocations or for general allocations uh, means that this carries over here as well. Okay? So this is a great open problem, actually, for research. We do know of an, uh, an approximation. There exists a fee approximation. Uh, this is the 0.618, the golden ratio. And that's, that's the best that, uh, that we know about this problem. Um, okay. And uh, another approach is to look at fairness in the presence of a social graph. Okay, so uh, one reason that envy freeness is very strong is because we require that I do not envy any other agent in, you know, in this context. Uh, maybe uh, we can restrict uh, envy freeness to hold only for the people I interact with. Okay? So we could imagine that we have a social network. Okay? And uh, there have been some recent works on this uh, where you evaluate fairness with regard to your neighbors. Okay? So this means that uh, uh, you try to you know, redefine envy freeness and proportionality only with respect to, you know, to the goods allocated to you and to the goods allocated to, to your neighbors. Okay, so this is what's happening in these papers. As you see, these are all very recent works. Uh, and most definitions are very easy to adapt. For example, envy freeness would just mean that I do not envy, you know, just the neighbors in the social graph, okay? And uh, there have been some more extensions, uh, actually, uh, which is something in between the full information setting and then um, looking only at the neighbors, where uh, some extensions have been given where you do not completely ignore you know, what happens to the rest of the agents, the, the, the subset of the goods that are allocated to the rest of the agents. Okay, so this is still a fertile land for you know, uh, new discoveries. So that was one, uh, one thing. Uh, in terms of mechanism design, okay, so you already asked me about uh, existence of truthful mechanisms. Uh, we assume so far that uh, you know, these are uh, non-strategic agents, uh, but of course you know, agents may misreport their evaluations, so can we design truthful mechanisms uh, in such a setting? Uh, we have mostly negative uh, results here. Uh, the thing is that in the, you know, in the traditional fair division literature, these are mechanism design problems without money. So if we want to look at the problem without the existence of monetary transfers, uh, then uh, it, it becomes quite hard to actually get positive results. Uh, so uh, we studied this problem last year together with my students, uh, Amanatidis and Birbas, and with George Christodoulou. And uh, we got some tight results, but only for two players. So if we have two agents and additive valuations, uh, our results were obtained by first actually having a characterization of truthful mechanisms for this uh, setting. And uh, what we got is that, uh, what we got shows a clear separation between what is achievable by truthful and non-truthful mechanisms. Um, in particular, for MMS allocation, the best truthful approximation we have is uh, a 1 over M approximation. Okay? Um, so this is in sharp constant contrast to, to the fact that we have uh, constant factor approximations for, uh, for by non-truthful algorithms. Okay. Uh, so yeah, unfortunately, we cannot go beyond that. Yeah. So for the for the high result of two player, are they choose for MV3 or choose for proportional? Yeah. So actually, for MV3 and proportional, the situation is even worse. Uh, we cannot pretty much, basically, we cannot get any decent approximation algorithms for envy freeness and proportionality. Okay? So, for that, choose for results, so what are the requirements? So, for example, I can 
uh, two players and additive valuations. I can, I can just add yeah, yeah, but, but, but this uh, does not get, yield a good approximation. Of course, yeah, uh, you can get very easily truthful mechanisms. Just take any good and decide uh, where to allocate it on your own without looking at the valuation function. So there exist truthful mechanisms, but uh, they do not have good approximations, okay? Uh, to MMS or to the best possible envy or to proportionality. So uh, you cannot hope to get any decent approximation for, you know, for minimizing the envy, for example, if you want truthfulness. Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, additive, yes. So these negative results hold for additive valuations. Okay. Uh, and for MMS, uh, the es essentially the best possible truthful approximation is a very simple one. Uh, just uh, take one agent and ask him to get uh, his favorite good and then give the rest of the goods to the other agent. Okay? This achieves uh, this guarantee. There are other mechanisms that also achieve this guarantee, but this one works. Okay? And uh, is already an order one over m approximation. Uh, actually, for EF1, it's also very interesting. Uh, there are truthful mechanisms that achieve EF1 only if the number of agents is at most four. Uh, we cannot get truthfulness and EF1 uh, otherwise. Okay. So, yeah, truthfulness is a very strong requirement. But uh, what is interesting here is you would expect that since we got this for two players, uh, that uh, this characterization results would go through for a, or, or would yield something for a higher number of players. We do not know how to characterize truthful mechanisms for at least three players, so we do not know how to argue actually about uh, uh, getting anything for. We know how to get one over m approximations for uh, MMS, but uh, uh, this characterization results that we used in order to get our tight results, uh, they do not hold anymore. And so for three uh, and more players, uh, negative results need you know, to go through some kind of partial characterization at least, because you need to argue about any possible truthful mechanism. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, here for three players, we're still in the dark. Okay. We don't know uh, what's the best answer. Okay, and I want to conclude this tutorial by, okay, sure. uh, by looking at the continuous setting. Uh, so this involved uh, just the discrete setting so far, but um, I want, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> the temptation was very high. I, I really want to mention this open problem for the continuous setting uh, because it's really uh, one of the greatest open problems I have encountered, at least in my uh, research life so far. Uh, so uh, it, it's a very intriguing question. I, I really uh, find it hard to believe that, uh, that we still don't understand it so well. So uh, in the continuous setting, uh, I will talk only about additive valuations here. Uh, the cake, the resources, are usually just the interval from 0 to 1, okay? And we have uh, a set of agents with additive valuations where the valuations are uh, probability measures on uh, 0, 1, okay? Uh, now, the axis here to the valuation function, so the computational model that we use, is uh, by allowing uh, value queries and cut queries. Uh, a value query is what you imagine uh, the mechanism, the algorithm asks for uh, the value of an agent uh, given a subset of the, of the interval, 0, 1. Cut queries just ask an agent to produce a subinterval of a certain value. Okay? Um, so, in the continuous setting, as I said, uh, envy free, proportional locations, competitive equilibria, all these things exist. Uh, but how about uh, computation? Uh, for proportional allocations, uh, computing them is okay. There are n log n algorithms that uh, uh, compute them. Now, for envy free allocations, for n equals 2, the cut and choose protocol uh, is okay. okay. It produces an envy free al algorithm allocation with just uh, two queries. One person cuts, the other person chooses. For three agents, uh, there is the, uh, an algorithm by Selfridge and Conway that was discovered uh, more than 50 years ago. Uh, and it requires uh, less than uh, 15 queries to be implemented. So we are okay uh, for three agents as well. 
problems start at four agents. Uh, for four agents, uh, this was an open question up until last year. Uh, and the algorithm that was proposed by Aziz and Mackenzie requires about 600 queries. So you see the difference here between 15 and uh, 600. Apart from that, it's a very uh, difficult to understand algorithm with a big case analysis. Uh, you know, it's, it's a complicated thing that you know, for four agents to be able to produce an envy-free allocation, somehow it's, it should be simpler, right? It's, um, and now uh, let's move to the case of N agents. For N agents, the only algorithm that was known up until last year was an algorithm by Brams and Taylor, which was finite, but with no upper bound on the number of queries. Why is that? Because um, the algorithm terminated, but uh, the complexity depended on the valuation functions, on properties of the valuation functions. So that means that no upper bound in terms of n could be given. Okay? Uh, so last year, there was an algorithm that was proposed uh, by Aziz and Mackenzie. And this is the best thing that we know. And the number of queries that is required is this n to the n to the n to the n to the n. Now, OK, maybe it's because envy freeness is a very hard uh, thing, OK? It's, uh, it's hard to eliminate envy in the real world anyway. So, you know, even for two agents sometimes, like in couples. <laughs> uh, now, in terms of lower bounds, uh, we know very few things. Uh, for contiguous species, if we want allocations with contiguous species, uh, there is no finite protocol that can achieve this, OK? Uh, so, if we want to settle for allocations that do not necessarily produce contiguous species, we know only of an omega n square bound. So there is a gap right now between n square and n to the n to the n to the n. Um, I should say that this lower bound separates n difference from proportionality because for proportional allocations we know of an n log n upper bound and the omega n log n lower bound. So, so proportionality is uh, settled in the continuous setting. So yeah, I think this is really an exciting uh, open question. Uh, and apart from the complexity, apart from reducing this thing here, uh, I think that it is important to find an algorithm that is uh, more intuitive, more simpler to understand. Okay? It's, uh, because this algorithm here, it's not just the complexity, it's, it's also, you know, I, I have read the paper, but if you ask me right now how does it work, I cannot explain to you. It's really, I cannot explain to myself how, why this works. Okay, um, okay so summarizing. Uh, a few years ago, someone would say that uh, you know, fair division with indivisible goods, you know, it, it's a closed case. There are no interesting problems. These uh, traditional concepts are hard, so there is, we should not bother working on this. Uh, at the moment, I would say that it looks like a very rich area. It has uh, rejuvenated with these new concepts that have been defined. So I think that there are several uh, challenging ways to go from here. At the conceptual level, I think that uh, uh, we still need to either define new fairness concepts or we can investigate further the existing notions. At an algorithmic level, uh, uh, as you saw, you know, we still don't know what's the best approximation for MMS allocations. For EFX, we are really in the dark. Uh, for pairwise MMS allocations, uh, we don't know anything. And for the continuous setting, as I said, um, there is this uh, really great open question. And in terms of uh, game theoretic aspects, I think that trying to understand how truthful mechanisms look like for three agents and onwards, yeah, it's something that um, um, we should be able to make some progress in the next years on it. So again, thank you very much for inviting me for the tutorial. <laughs> In the definition of the MMS value, allow fractional allocations? So maximizing over all fractional allocations of the uh, minimum? I think then it's easy. Uh, because it's identical to proportionality, I think. Yeah. 
if you allow fractional locations, then you are in proportion. You are back to proportionality. So, for additive valuations, for example, just divide every good uh, uh, into uh, n pieces, um, into n equal pieces. For non-additive valuations, uh, I, I would think again it's proportionality, but I'm not. Um, yeah, you cannot divide it in uh, n pieces anymore, but. Uh, but for additive, it's definitely yeah, easy. I'm curious. So for truthfulness, it's, yeah. it's a hard problem, uh, as yes. you pointed out. And we don't even understand exactly why it's hard and where it's impossible. But I'm curious if you think that there are good relaxations of truthfulness that people should be looking at specifically yeah, for actually, resource allocation. Uh, that's a good question. Yes, I think that uh, it, it's a... Uh, I, I don't have a relaxation of truthfulness to suggest, but uh, but I think that uh, going that way would be really nice. It's, uh, uh, so, for example, when you allow pricing, because here it's mechanic design without money, right? If you allow uh, monetary transfers, uh, then envy freeness can be seen as a relaxation of truthfulness in, in certain contexts. Okay. Uh, by, uh, by defining envy freeness with respect to the payments as well. But, uh, so uh, in that case, uh, yes, there are some relaxations of truthfulness that maybe make sense. Now, without monetary transfers, I don't know what would be a good relaxation of uh, a truthful mechanism. But, but if uh, someone comes up with something like that, I think it will, probably would be appreciated. 